Hi there. Uh, welcome to AP Biofun with Dr. D, part two of control of gene expression. So I left this for the second part of the tutorial because it is really an important topic. DNA in um, eukaryotic cell is not simply a naked DNA. DNA is wrapped around proteins, histone proteins, and other proteins. And collectively, this is called chromatin. So on this picture here, what you will see on the left, you will see a model drawing of um, DNA. Um, and on the right is actually a picture taken by an electron microscope of this. So you will see here naked DNA. Uh, the second part is there are several levels of packaging. Is DNA wrapped around an octamer that is eight proteins of different histones, and it's called usually beads on a string. Further packaging on this level, and you see how it looks under the microscope, and even more packaging and more, and the highest level of condensation, chromatin condensation and packaging, DNA condensation occurs in mitosis. We can actually see these even with a regular light microscope. But what I hope you can appreciate from this is that RNA polymerase is a protein. Transcription factors and other proteins are needed to transcribe DNA. DNA replication enzymes are also protein. They also need access to the DNA to replicate it. DNA repair proteins need access to DNA to repair it. Well, how do they access it if it's so tightly packaged? So chromatin is really inaccessible for the most part to proteins that are designed to regulate any type of thing that is happening to DNA, okay? So histones, nucleosomes, the tight packaging of DNA is really a barrier to anything that must happen to DNA. So chromatin is in constant flux. It's constantly being remodeled so that proteins that need access to DNA can access DNA and do their job. We're gonna specifically focus on transcription, but chromatin modifications and chromatin remodeling are important for other processes as well. The more tightly packaged DNA is, the less likely it is that it will be expressed, and the more loose it is, the most likely it will be expressed. So how is chromatin packaged? Um, well, it turns out that there are certain modifications that happen that ensure that DNA is packaged. Um, one is DNA methylation, so certain bases, nucle uh, certain nucleotides, and specifically the nitrogenous bases, do get methylated, so a methyl group is added to them. And another one is the histones themselves get um, modified. They get acetylated, they get methylated. So chemical modifications of either the DNA or the histones can influence how tightly or how loosely packaged um, chromatin is. So chromatin modifications that influence transcription in summary are, so histones can be modified, they can be methylated um, or acetylated. So if you add a methyl group, usually what means is that transcription is off, chromatin is tightly packaged. If you are acetylated, that is adding a acetyl group, that usually means chromatin is loose and transcription is on. So if you deacetylate histones, if you remove the acetylation, you're turning things off. If you methylate them, you also turn things off. The opposite being acetylation will turn things off. Now you're not required to remember all of these. This is just so that you can understand that chemical modifications, different chemical modifications will affect, of histones will affect how tightly or how loosely chromatin is packaged and therefore will affect whether genes are transcribed or not. In addition to that, the nucleosomes themselves can actually, those beads on a string can be slit. So you can slide them to the left or to the right to reveal places where DNA needs to be exposed. And finally, DNA is methylated in certain places. And when DNA is methylated, that means that DNA is like off, everything's off, nothing can be done to it. Now, all of these chromatin modifications may or may not be epigenetic changes. We're gonna talk a little bit more about epigenetics in a 
few minutes. But let's go back to DNA methylation. DNA methylation is actually one of the earliest epigenetic marks to be discovered. So certain places in our DNA are heavily methylated. So the DNA is chemically modified. So what does DNA methylation do? It has a huge role in a phenomenon called imprinting. And believe it or not, this is not something we talked about, but it's something very interesting. There are um, probably a dozen genes in our genome, which are expressed only if you inherited them from one parent, but not from the other. So some of those genes are expressed only if you inherited them from the mother. Others are only expressed if you inherited them from, from the father. There are few of them, but there are those. Additionally, we already talked about it. One of the X chromosomes in females is always inactivated. So if you have more than one X chromosome, I should say, if you have more than one X chromosome, because you could be an XXY or triple X, if you have more than one chromosome, one of the chromosome is inactivated through DNA methylation, ensuring that there's equal expression of genes whether you have one X chromosome or you have two or three or so on. So the other role there is, remember we talked about these uh, jumping genes, these repeats that we have in the genome. Well, they need to be silent too because we don't want them jumping around like crazy. So DNA methylation is a very important epigenetic mark. So X chromosome inactivation, a very, very interesting phenomenon. One of our X chromosomes, if you're biologically female, is always shut down, it's inactivated. But which one is going to be is random. It happens early in development and it is completely random. And the best way to illustrate this is that fur color in cats is encoded by a gene which is on the X chromosome, okay? So if you look at a tortoise shell cat, you can literally see which cells have inactivated one chromosome, X chromosome, and which cells have inactivated the other X chromosome. So what is epigenetics? So epigenetics are really heritable changes in phenotype without any change in the DNA sequence. Now imagine that the DNA sequence doesn't change, but the phenotypes might be different and they're heritable. How does that happen? Well, it happens through chromatin modifications that we just talked about, modifications of histones or modifications of DNA. The underlying DNA sequence is not changed, but it's the modifications that are different. And these modifications may or may not be passed to future generations of cells. So if they are passed to future generations of cells, if they're heritable, we call them epigenetic changes. So the inheritance of traits, which are transmitted by a mechanism not directly involving the nucleotide sequence, is called epigenetic inheritance. Epigenetic literally means on top of genetics, something that is on top of genetics. Epigenetic modifications can be reversed, unlike DNA sequence mutations. So the term epigenetics really refers to heritable changes in gene expression. So heritable change in the expression that do not involve the change in the DNA sequence. And it can really lead to a change of phenotype without a change in genotype. Epigenetics change is a regular and natural occurrence, but it can also be influenced by several factors, including age, environment, lifestyle, and disease state. A great example of epigenetic changes is a phenomenon that has been observed for many years, how identical twins, which have identical DNA sequence, over time, as they grow older and they're adults and they grow in different environments, now as adults, um, start to look differently because of epigenetic changes. So finally, we need to talk about this um, new, weird, and also um, interesting phenomena, and that's the phenomenon of RNA molecules playing a role in regulating gene expression. 
they're called non-coding RNAs, and they're non-coding because they themselves are not used to produce proteins. So it turns out that only a small fraction of DNA encodes proteins. And a very small fraction of the non-protein coding DNA consists of genes for RNA, such as ribosomal RNA and tRNA. A significant amount of our genome might be transcribed into non-coding RNAs or nCRNAs. So they don't code for proteins, so they're not mRNAs, they're not ribosomal RNAs, they're not tRNAs. So what are they? They're RNAs, which we did not fully understand until recently, and we still don't fully understand. We, we did not understand until recently what their function was. Well, it turns out they can regulate gene expression at several different points. One such example are microRNAs. MicroRNAs are small single-strand RNA molecules that can bind to complementary mRNA sequences. They can either degrade the mRNA or block its translation. And here's an example. So microRNAs or siRNAs, small interfering RNAs, that's all you need to remember. They're small RNA molecules that are, can base pair with a specific mRNA. So they're complementary to one or two specific mRNA molecules. And once they base pair, proteins will either degrade the mRNA, destroy it, or that base pairing can lead to translation being blocked. In either case, you will not be producing any protein. So if you express an mRNA, a small RNA that is complementary to your mRNA, that mRNA will not produce a protein because it will be either degraded or translation of it will be blocked, okay? So another class is called small interfering RNAs. Small interfering RNAs and mRNAs are very similar, but they just come from a different place. They form from different precursors. The phenomenon of inhibition of gene expression by sRNA is called RNA interference. So the RNA interferes essentially with gene expression and that's why it's called RNA interference. These are also used by researchers to very quickly remove a protein of interest from cells in order to study its function. And you're likely to encounter them in a scenario on the exam when researchers are expressing these small RNAs that are complementary to a given mRNA to abolish gene expression, to abolish the production of a given protein. Okay, and finally, I would like to remind you that regulation in eukaryotes is complex, but it can be really boils down to this, that you have a limited number of regulatory sequences called enhancers, and they're all here represented in different colors. And you have a limited number of transcription factors that can bind to these enhancer elements, right, on DNA. And it really is the different combination. So you can make many different gene expression profiles. So all of these genes, one through five, are expressed in different tissues or at different times. Why? Because they all have a different combination of, let's say, how many are they here? One, two, three, four, five different or six different regulatory elements and transcription factors. So by combining regulation by multiple uh, regulators, you can actually mix and match and you can produce many different um, expression patterns. And this is the end. I would like to thank you for bearing with me and I will see you next time. Have a great day.